I mean, certainly some of my most important growths have come from people in the teacher position telling me things I didn't want to hear and certainly wasn't going to tell myself. And there are other times when what teachers have said I think has been quite irrelevant for where I needed to go. So yeah, it's a balance between those things. And it's hard to find a good balance, you know. We, I tend to get guilty about it, you know. I should be obedient and just do what the teacher says and all that kind of thing uh, versus, of course, I should be able to do this all myself. And we don't have a very good tradition of where to do it there. I keep reading that in the East they're more sophisticated about this. They all profess total devotion to all their teachers and then do whatever they want. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have any thoughts about the role that meditation should play in the practice of psychotherapy? Mm -hmm. <coughs> the role meditation should play in psychotherapy depends, of course, on the particular client, what their problem is, and where to expect to go. If you, for instance, are doing a kind of therapy that's very much an insight-based therapy, something like mindfulness meditation can help make a person generally more insightful and generally more able to tolerate unpleasant kinds of things and so have a chance of opening up to insights. If you're doing more a behavior modification kind of thing, then that kind of insight probably wouldn't be particularly good. Unless, no, no, the way you could work this in, and there's a guy at the University of West Florida, William Miklaus, who's done some ingenious work this way. He talks about meditation in behaviorist terms. You know, he talks about behaviors of the mind. If you could use something like insight meditation to teach a person to become more sensitive to the body sensations that indicate some maladaptive behavior is going to occur, then they have a better chance of controlling that behavior in this sort of precursor stage than when it comes on full-fledged. So you can even use it in a behavioristic approach that way. There are a number of psychotherapists scattered around here and there who are beginning to experiment combining these things. Uh, I don't think they've had a major impact on psychotherapy in general yet, but I think someday they will. It's, it's not an organized kind of movement too much yet that I know of. And again, understand I'm not a psychotherapist. I'm a, I'm a theoretical psychotherapist rather than a practicing one. So count that in as part of my answer. Yeah. Hi, I come from a, a spiritual tradition where, first of all, the teacher doesn't actually teach meditation. He gives us a mantra, or what we call isti'az, a word. But he doesn't teach how to meditate. And then we ask not to ever discuss um, any, so any kind of experiences with anyone. So in terms of transpersonal psychological research, You'd be a lousy research subject. <laughs> <laughs> find out anything about what was happening. So, my, so the premise I, I, I would uh, consider is that perhaps what we're looking at is just side effects of meditation. And you're looking at possible side effects of different types of meditation and creating a, a theory about it, whereas in fact it is the treatment that is the most important, not the side effects that go with it. That would be one of the premises I would, I would put to, to consider. I would like to see research done on that premise, if it could be done. I mean, it's quite possible, you know, that a particular method, say, doing a certain mantra, has inherent effects quite aside from anything you're taught about it. Uh, I consider that a possibility, but one about which I don't have any data to speak of, because even in a tradition where there's not much overt teaching, there's implicit teaching. There's something in the situation itself that makes suggestions about this. You know, I mean, if you go to a holy person and he tells you to do something, he may never mention the word spiritual, but you know this has got some kind of connection there somewhere. But yes, I'd certainly like to see that. And it, it's again true that a lot of the effects we consider due to meditation might be consequences of defining yourself as a meditator and belonging to such and such a group that does certain spiritual practices. So we need to separate those things out also. It, it's, a, it's a real beautiful world we live in if we bother to pay attention to it. And of course it's a real horrible world at times too, which is one of the reasons we've gotten in the habit of not paying attention to it. But when all this becomes automatized and we have no choice over what we do, we're stuck. Yeah? Could you elaborate on the, the notion of breath in, uh, in the possible, maybe with that 
specific reference to, say, a feeling, how you would see feeling from that perspective? Sure. Let's say you're doing a form of Vipassana where you're told to notice whatever the most prominent body sensation at any particular moment is. Okay? Without, without attempting to hold it or to change it, you know? So you start doing that and there's a funny buzzing feeling in your shoulder and that moves down to a, a long swarm sensation in your upper arm and of course in real life it moves faster than you can describe it out loud and something like that. If you could just follow that fairly well, you'd be acquiring some breadth right there in the sense if you were opening yourself on the very broad criterion of whatever is strongest, without going crazy over which is the, the strongest of all if there are two things close together. And since sensations in your body will continually keep changing, you're beginning to practice breadth in what is happening regardless of what I want. Because see, our normal mindset is, I know what I want and I'm out to get it. And I know what I don't want and I'm going to push that out of the way as rapidly as possible. Now, breadth might go further in that, let's say, you're noticing a particular sensation and uh, you might be instructed to say, well, you describe a burning sensation in your shoulder. How about the spatial distribution of that burning sensation? How big is it at this moment? Okay, now, how big is it at this moment? Is it bigger or smaller? You might make relatively crude distinctions, bigger, or smaller, something like that. You eventually might be able to notice just where the edges of that burning sensations are and its movement out and back in and around and something like that. And you're beginning to get layers of it. Except that I, I just didn't illustrate the layer point I wanted to make. You may begin to notice that it has several different components to it that there's not only a burning, there's a vibrating quality to it also. Uh, this kind of thing is very useful incidentally because it can eventually generalize over into emotions and a lot of times when you have an emotion, if you have learned to pay attention to the bodily components of it, you may find it's actually a mixture of two or more emotions or that there's one main emotion but it's on top of another emotion and keeping the second one out of sight. and feeling that other emotion and beginning to see what that's about is really very important in terms of eventual insight. Breadth, clarity, and equanimity. So you see, meditation as a controlled attention practices go many, many places. I've just talked about a few of the very main ones here. There are lots of directions that I haven't even begun to think about, much less mention here, all of them could be made more effective, okay? Again, you know, maybe it's just my karma to be a Westerner and be hung up on the idea of progress, but in a hundred years, I'd like to say, gee, in the uh, 21st century, there was a lot of progress made in meditation, and now 15 out of a hundred stick around instead of five out of a hundred, and they gain much more in five years than people used to gain in 25 years, something like that. And we know when to send them out for psychoanalysis or behavior modification or a Prozac prescription or something like that and get better results in the long run. That's what I'd like to find out about in a hundred years. I guess I'll have to come back in another incarnation to find that out. <laughs> wonder if I'll remember the question. <laughs> anyway, I hope I've left some interesting questions in your mind and thank you all for coming.